All right, well, good afternoon, uh, cohort B. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry this uh, video is coming to you late. I, I just really could not do it last night. So anyway, I'm going to try to quickly go through this for you. I hope you can hear me well. I'm actually in the classroom, okay, and uh, doing this on the smart board. So, okay, so let's talk about lesson five. And lesson five starts out with... Uh, probably the most important object besides the earth for us in our solar system is the sun okay so we're going to talk about the sun a little bit and uh, we're going to talk about the interior structure of the sun now this is actually quite an amazing story um, how do we know so much about what goes on inside that great big star of ours in the center of our solar system well to answer that question i want you to look at this picture here for a second so here you see a picture and what you're looking at is an underground observatory. It's in the shape of a huge sphere. Now, if you see, there's guys, um, sorry, guys down here, okay? Uh, that gives you an idea of scale. So it's this big tank of water, actually, okay, that sphere. And all dotted around the outside, these are cameras that are pointing on the inside. And what they're designed to do is do one thing. They're designed to detect uh, light emissions, okay? The tank is filled with heavy water. Now, heavy water is actually, um, they use, like, you know how water is H2O, okay? So water is H2O. Well, normal hydrogen, actually, I'll use, uh, let me switch to the color black. So normally, hydrogen is one proton which has a positive charge and then there's one electron that's sort of nearby and sort of region around that proton okay and that's what a hydrogen atom looks like well for heavy water there's a version of hydrogen called deuterium it's still hydrogen because it has one proton okay but stuck to the proton is a neutron it's neutral that's why we call them neutrons and it's stuck to it inside the nucleus of the atom there's still one electron going around there so water normal water is h2o so let me write it like this h2o that's the water that makes up most of your body right well deuterium heavy water has deuterium instead of hydrogen it's still hydrogen but it's heavier about 20 percent heavier so it's D2O, okay? So that tank is filled with D2O. It's filled with water. It looks like water, tastes like water, okay? But it's a bit heavier. In fact, if you were to change all the water in your body to heavy water, you'd be about 20% heavier, but you wouldn't be any more like a, that wouldn't be in your fat tissue or muscle tissue or anything. It would just be the water content of your body, okay? Anyway, there you go. So that's what's filled in that tank. Now, why do we do this? It's buried deep down in a mine shaft, and it's it's there to study the sun. Okay. Well, what you don't know about the sun is the sun is emitting a lot of radiation that you can't see. One of those kinds of radiations are called neutrino radiation. Okay. Neutrino is comes from a Latin words that mean little neutral one. Okay. Uh, the neutrino neutrinos are so small and so insignificant. Right now, trillions of them are passing through your body, and you don't even know it. You're not aware of it. They don't interact with your body at all. In fact, they pass through our entire planet without interacting with it for the most part. But every once in a while, a neutrino will collide with one of these D2O molecules, and when it does that, there's a very faint flash of light. So these cameras are designed to detect that, and then we can study the properties of those neutrinos this way. And we have learned more about what goes on inside our star than any telescope could ever tell us, okay, in this observatory that's buried deep down in a Sudbury mine shaft, okay, called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. Anyway, you know, you'll learn more about neutrinos and everything else in grade 11 and 12 physics. But, uh, you know, we're just going to introduce this topic to you now. But that's how we know what's going on inside the sun. Now, I have a diagram for you here, okay. So this is like the, the sun has a structure to it. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start at the core. Okay. 
So the core is where the nuclear reactions are taking place. So in the core, I'll just write it down here. What's happening in the core is that hydrogen atoms are being fused. If you take two hydrogen atoms and you fuse them together under tremendous heat and pressure that exists in the core of our sun, they fuse together and form helium. Okay? So hydrogen, I'm using the letter H to represent hydrogen. That's on the periodic table. Uh, two hydrogens will join together in the core and form helium. And when they do that, there's a tremendous amount of heat generated, generated in the process. Okay? Maybe just two atoms doing it wouldn't be that much. But remember, they, the sun is mostly hydrogen. Okay? And there is literally trillions and trillions of tons of hydrogen down there in the core. So when you get a lot of this going on, you have this massive, massive nuclear reactor. That's basically what the sun is. It's a gigantic nuclear reactor. And what it's doing is fusing hydrogen to form helium, and in the process, releasing a tremendous amount of heat and light. Okay? So that's what's going on in the core. So in the core is a process called nuclear fusion. Okay? A nuclear fusion is this process. This is a process of, of fusing hydrogen to produce helium, okay? and in the process also releasing, coincidentally, a ton of heat and light. Okay, and that's what's happening on this massive scale inside this core right here. Now, right next to the core is a zone called the radiative zone. Okay, so it's almost like you're peeling an orange or something, right? So, or an apple. Let's take an apple because it has a core. So you got a core at the center, or a peach or something. Then you've got this like radiative zone, is like sort of the flesh, okay, that surrounds the uh, the nut, sort of the center of a peach, okay. And what's happening in that sort of fleshy area is the heat and light that generated in the core are migrating through this hot hydrogen helium gas that are present in the convective zone, or sorry, in the radiative zone. And the, the, the gravity is so intense. Remember how big the sun is, right? Like it's like 333,000 Earths in mass. There's a, it's a very, very intense gravitational field inside the star, especially at the core and at the radiative zone. Now that gravitational field is so strong that even light has a hard time escaping it, okay? So what happens is it takes light in the radiative zone. Here, I'm just gonna number these, number two, starting from the center, working our way out. In the radiative zone, like this, it actually takes light a million years. migrate through it. Okay, so the radiation from the core in the form of light, that's what we call it, the radiative zone, is slowly working its way out, okay, through the dense gravitational field, the intense gravitational field, and the dense gas, okay, that's present in that zone. The light makes its way through. So, in other words, the light, if you step outside today and the sun hits you, that light was created in the core a million years ago, okay? Back when there were saber-toothed tigers and mammoths roaming the earth and human civilization didn't even exist. That's when the light was created in the core that's hitting you today. It's kind of cool when you think of it that way, okay? Anyway, that's what's happening in the radiative zone. All right, now moving on. After the radiative zone is the convective zone, okay? So that's this zone right here. So that's zone number three. Now, convection, like I was telling the students today, in the convective zone, what's happening is hot gas rises because it's less dense. Like a hot air balloon rises, right, guys? Like hot air balloon, you make the air hot, that air gets less dense. And because of uh, buoyancy, it will start to rise and cooler air is more dense and that will fall. So if we let the balloon cool off, it'll fall back down, okay? And same thing's happening in the convective zone. We call this process where hot gas rises and cool gas falls, we call it convection, okay? 
So what happens is hot air naturally rises, cold air naturally falls, and that creates a current of moving fluid, or in this case gases, with hot coming up from the, the, the heat is generated in the core. So heat here, and I'll show you the way the current works, I'll use the blue. So hot gas coming here will rise up to the outer skin okay, of the sun called the photosphere. We'll get to that in a moment. But then what happens is the outer skin is exposed to outer space. Outer space is very cold, so that gas cools off slightly. Nothing about the sun is ever really cold, but like it cools off. So there's 15 million degrees in the core, like I should mention. 15 million degrees Celsius, okay, at the core. And that's the temperature at which hydrogen fuses, okay? So once you get to the edge of the convective zone, the temperature drops out here to a temperature right there of only about 6,000 degrees Celsius. So you see it's cooling off quite a bit as that gas rises to the surface. And so cold gas will fall back down. So it'll go like that, it'll fall back down where it gets heated up again. And that creates what we call convection currents that look like this with hot gas rising to the top, getting cooled and then falling back down. Okay, so it's a very turbulent layer with lots of fluidic motion with hot gas rising and cold gas falling down. Sort of like the way wind blows on planet Earth. When the sun heats the crust, hot air rises, cold air in the upper atmosphere that's closer to space falls down and we get wind during the day. You ever notice when the sun sets, sometimes the wind dies down. That's when wind is caused by convection currents like this. Okay, so we call it the convective layer, or the convective zone, okay? Now, now we're at the skin, okay? We've gone through the flesh of the peach here, and now we're at the outer skin. Now, the first layer of skin, there's two layers to it. The first layer of skin is called the photosphere. So number four, switch back, number four is the photosphere. And the photosphere is... The photo means light, okay? And this is the surface, okay? I'll just put that in quotes. That gives off all the light. So when you're looking at the sun and you see the disc, let's say you've got protective eyeglasses on, you can see the disc, you're looking at the photosphere, okay? Uh, that gives off the light. This is the visible disc of the sun, okay? The bright, bright disc that you see giving off all that light, that's the photosphere, okay? It surrounds the entire sun as a sort of like a thin skin that surrounds the whole thing. Like here, you can see it's sort of pointing there. It's pointing to that skin, okay? Now, just on top of that skin, there's kind of an invisible layer that we call the chromosphere, okay? Chromo means color, okay? Uh, but anyway, the chromosphere is where you sometimes see these sort of eruptions from the surface. So it's almost like the first part of the sun's atmosphere, okay? So number five, the chromosphere is a thin atmosphere, okay? So now what's happening is, as you get further away from the core, the gravity is getting weaker, and so it's more farther apart, like the gas molecules. Like when you look at the surface of the sun, it almost looks like this boiling liquid, but it's actually just a very dense gas, okay? And what's happening is, as you get farther from the sun's center, the pull of gravity gets weaker and these molecules get further apart, okay? And it starts looking like a regular atmosphere like we have around the Earth. Okay, a thin atmosphere just above the photo, the, just above, whoops. Wow, I'm having a hard time. Above the photosphere. And we know it's there because sometimes you see like eruptions. And 
argument to write n prominences from this layer. Okay? We'll talk about those in a moment. Okay, now finally, number six. The sun has a crown, like this big sort of atmosphere that reaches out millions of kilometers into the space around it. Um, you can only see this crown when the disk itself is blocked, let's say by an eclipse, or let's say by uh, a telescope that is blotting out the disk of the sun itself, and then you'll be able to see the surrounding atmosphere. Okay, And that, that big atmosphere that has far reaching, re really reaches way out into the solar system, is called, and this is a loaded term, it's called the corona. Okay, This is a halo like crown that extends uh, millions of kilometers, I'm just going to write like that, into space. And I'm just going to say it's like a thin atmosphere, but much like, okay, I shouldn't say thin. I'd say it's just a, you know, a low density, but quite large atmosphere, right? It means it's a, a low density gas, but it's a huge atmosphere. Okay, that extends way, like it's, it's the biggest part of, of the sun itself, but we don't see it at all unless there's an eclipse. Okay, you can see it with telescopes that are designed to, you know, like coronal telescopes that can see the corona uh, by blotting out the sun like an eclipse. They just put sort of a, an obstacle in front of the disk, and then you can see the corona that surrounds it. So you're sort of like making your own little eclipse, just artificially when you have a telescope like that. So there you go, guys. Those are, that's basically all the structure of the sun. You need to be able to label a diagram like this on a test. There are a couple of other things I'd like to point out. A prominence is an extrusion of the chromosphere, okay? Uh, so it sort of protrudes out from the sun's surface, from the photosphere and the chromosphere. A flare is an eruption. So this is like a bulge. This one is an eruption. Now, it almost looks like lava erupting off the surface, but it, remember, these are just extremely hot gas in the form of something called plasma. It's, it's in gaseous form. Okay, but it looks like liquid because it's so dense. Okay, so anyway, that's basically it. You don't have to worry about the temperature minimum. Oh, I, I should mention this. Uh, the photosphere is the coldest part. So here, the photosphere, this is around 6,000 degrees C. Okay, um, that's the coldest part of the sun. Okay, and that's why they say temperature minimum there. Uh, you don't have to worry about this. Okay, that term there is not relevant for you. Okay, but the photosphere is 6,000 degrees Celsius. That's the coldest part. The atmosphere of the sun is actually around a million degrees Celsius. So I should mention that, that the chromosphere, this is, this is the cool part. 6,000 degrees Celsius. But here, the chromosphere and the corona are at around 1 million degrees Celsius. A lot colder than the core, but much hotter than the photosphere. Okay, Photosphere is more dense, and I guess it radia it's radiating all that light out into space, and that's cooling it down in the process. Okay, So, there you go. We've got, like, all that's all the structure of the sun you need to know. I've got a pretty cool video that I'd like to show you to give you some sense of this. So, check this out. I'm going to leave the audio on, maybe. Oh, there's no audio there. Actually, I'm going to turn the audio off. Okay. So what you're seeing here is a solar prominence, okay? Now, I told the students in class, and I'll show you this tomorrow when you come to class as a demonstration, 
what creates that is the sun's magnetic field. So the sun has an extremely powerful magnetic field. Now, a magnet can deflect charged particles. So the sun is filled with ions, which are a type of charged particle, like ionized gas. And what happens is you're seeing magnetic field lines here. So if you look at that, and here you can see Earth showing the scale to show you how huge this prominence is. And the prominence is this dynamic sort of bulge. It bulges out, and you're seeing the colder convection current there. Like So you see some gas falling back down as it cools off as it enters space. Okay, But the prominence itself is huge okay, thing, and it almost looks like rain falling down. But remember, that's just very hot plasma. It's a gas, actually. Okay, And there you go. So here you can really see what a solar prominence is. Every once in a while, that thing shoots out into space. Uh, sometimes if you just get sort of one shot shooting out, we call it a solar flare. But if the whole prominence gets ejected, we call it a coronal mass ejection. Okay, and those are some of the, some of the most interesting type of storms that occur on the sun's surface. All right, now I wanted to mention this. Um, here I showed them a, a, a little part. Oh, maybe I didn't show this today. Um, I talked about it though. Um, we've actually harnessed the power of the sun here on Earth in the form of nuclear power. So, and that came as a result of trying to develop the most terrifying weapons in the world, which remains to this day the nuclear bomb. Like one bomb, you could set off a bomb, okay? Like we have bombs today that if you set them off in Ottawa, it would vaporize our entire city in one shot and it would blow out windows in Toronto, okay? Like, I mean, these are the most devastating weapons the Earth has ever seen. It was a very scary time to be alive when they're developing these things. Now they've, the development has pretty much reached its pinnacle. You can't really make them any more powerful than they are. Uh, but they're powerful enough. We have enough bombs now existing in the world between Russia and the United States to destroy every city on the planet many times over. So it seems like kind of a pointless enterprise if we're all dead. But anyway, uh, that's how it is. Okay, and... How do these bombs work? Well, again, um, there are two types of bombs. One bomb is made by splitting atoms. We call them fission bombs. The first bomb, the one that was dropped on Japan, there's two of them actually, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were fission bombs. They work by splitting atoms. Fusion bombs are like what's going on in the sun's core. So if we can get the temperature to 15 million degrees, and we have hydrogen present, the hydrogen will start to fuse like it does in the sun's core. And when it does that, it, it, it gives you a little tiny, like we think it's a huge explosion and it is, but that's only a tiny fraction of what's going on in the, in the sun's core. So you set off, let's say like a few, you know, kilograms of hydrogen gas this way, you make it fuse and you get an explosion enough to destroy the city of Ottawa. But there's many, many, many hundreds of tons of hydrogen being fused every second in the sun. Okay, That's why it's such a big, bright ball. Okay, And it's kind of cool that how that works. The weapons are scary, but that's a fusion bomb does this. And I don't know if you know this or not, when they first were testing these bombs, they had no idea how powerful they would be. Okay, someone got the idea of putting hydrogen in there in a fission bomb, and then they made the first fusion bombs, and uh, the first one almost killed the scientists that were there studying it. They were some, you know, 20 miles away or something. They thought they were at a safe distance, and it turned out to have five times the explosive power than they originally estimated. So I'm just going to show you some of the pictures of this. Okay, and I'll, I'll let you listen to the audio. Or he did up. American and Soviet scientists race to build more powerful atomic bombs. Khrushchev said, let's show the Americans what we can do. But to test new weapons, both sides unleashed explosive power few understood, and none could control. We were pretty ignorant in those days. You could see the shockwave coming. And I turned around with my buddy, and I said, hey, I think they're gone. World's biggest bomb on secrets of the dead. Okay, I'm going to fast forward this. And I want to skip to the part where they tested. Yeah, so this, the island's called the Bikini Islands. The bathing suit named after these islands. 
Okay. And I'm the just original gonna World War II bomb design. Called Trinity, they derive their power from a fission reaction. Fission happens when an atom is split under such massive pressure, it creates a release of energy. In this case, 20 kilotons. Equal to 20,000 tons of TNT. But the hydrogen bomb was a fusion weapon and would soon make those early devices look primitive. There would be two key components, a basic atom bomb plus a tank of hydrogen isotopes such as tritium and deuterium. The primary explosion would force together or fuse the bomb fuel, producing immense heat. A thermonuclear reaction, releasing energy measured in megatons, millions of tons of TNT. The other important thing about a hydrogen reaction is that it's kind of like a fire. The more fuel you add, the bigger the fire. It has an unlimited potential size. Whereas the biggest fission weapon we ever built was half a megaton, 500,000 tons of TNT equivalent. Really couldn't get any bigger than that. We all agreed, at least the technical people, it would just be a matter of Together, these bombs had killed more than 150,000 okay. people. That's the one that hit Japan. Many more would perish from their injuries and the effects of radiation. As the war ended, the era of the weapon of mass destruction had begun. The countdown to the world's biggest bomb began when Soviet leader Joseph Stalin decided he too must have such a weapon. Two weeks after Hiroshima, he ordered scientists here to Moscow's Lebedev Institute to build him an atom bomb. Physicist Boris Altshuler was part of an elite community of Soviet scientists. His father, helped design Stalin's first bombs. My father really understood that they must have the bomb. Because it's necessary to save our country, to save peace as they believed it. I lived there and I can tell you they worked absolutely night and day to restore the balance. We physicists and chemists said it would be just a matter of time. In fact, the politicians thought it would take them longer than we thought it would take them. Agnew was now a key member of the team created to keep the United States ahead of the Soviet Union. And a series of vast experiments would be conducted here on Bikini Atoll. One of the most remote and for many years, most secret places on Earth. This coral atoll in the Marshall Islands lies 2,700 miles southwest of Hawaii. In 1946, the U.S. decided this is where it would test the next generation of weapons. Historian Richard Rhodes won a Pulitzer Prize for his book on the first atomic bombs. He says the A-bomb spelled excitement and even sex appeal. The bikini was invented by a French designer in 1946. They decided to name it after the, the sexiest place at that time on the planet, which was where the United States was conducting nuclear weapons tests. The bomb at that time had a kind of charisma that, of course, it, it soon lost. The bombs were big news, and the people of Bikini seemed happy to be center stage. These first pictures of the little island show the 165 men, women, and children as they prepare for the move to another small island. 
a safe distance away. Their now desert island would witness one of the most remarkable experiments ever conducted. Millions of dollars worth of weapons and a fleet of 95 warships were assembled in the lagoon. These junked Japanese, German, and American ships were here to test the power of the bomb. Different animals have been placed aboard the ship. Some were shaved in order that the effects of heat and radiation on their skin could be observed. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. I just want to pause it there. Like, look at that gigantic column of water. They set it off on one of the ships. And, like, I mean, it's just devastating. And that's a fission bomb. That's not even a fusion bomb. When they set off a fusion bomb, like I said, the scientists almost died because they thought they were safe distance away, and they weren't. But they got out, actually. They, didn't, they, they got uh, rescued by helicopter. And uh, were afraid that they were going to get radiation poisoning from the intense radiation that was there. But anyway, that's what's going on inside our star, guys. Like, not fission, but fusion, where there's a much more powerful, much hotter reaction than a fission bomb. I can imagine, like, like it, basically our sun is this gigantic nuclear reactor producing all the heat and light that the solar system has and so important for life on Earth, right? All right, so now let's move on. I have a worksheet for you that I already uploaded into your folder. It's really easy. These are just notes. Okay, so it's basically stuff I've already explained. All I want you to do with this, okay, when you get a moment, just do it right there within OneNote, is uh, mixing and matching, okay? So if you just have uh, some memory here, um, the layer of the sun's atmosphere that gives us visible light, okay, that would be the photosphere. Right? So that's the layer of the sun's atmosphere that gives off visible light. And uh, yeah, so just do the matching there and that's it. It's a lot, hey, brutal. I'm just recording a lesson. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Guys, Mr. Ruddy's here, so it's okay. I can't pause it. <laughs> Are you live right now? Not live. Oh, okay. Oh, then I'm just, uh, I'm just, but just recording it. But what's up? I just want to know if you had, you know that you had a, a, a computer that they gave you? Uh, the office gave you a computer? Like a laptop? Yeah, a laptop. Yeah, they gave me one. Are you using it all? Well, mine broke, so they gave me that one. But do you use it at all? I don't need it. Because Christina's, like, in a bad way, she, they, all they gave her, she has her personal computer. Yeah. And I'm just, uh, she's trying to figure things out. Nothing it's, it's on my desk. Is that okay? And the, uh, yeah, help yourself. Is there a code or something like that to enter? Or did, she just has to log in as herself. Okay, perfect. Thanks yeah. very much. Wayne. I didn't. There's no code. Sorry, guys. Oh, yeah, that's okay. All right, so guys, all I want you to do with this is just match up the uh, the matching section. So it's really quick. It'll just take a few minutes. All right, moving on. Okay, you're gonna love this story here, and just let me uh, talk about it here for a second. Um, here's the thing: the sun has a very, is a very violent little object in the center of our solar system and sometimes it ejects material towards the earth. Now there is a wind of this material that like travels out into space at somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 800 kilometers per second. Not that, not that one. Here, sorry, hi, I'm just talking to Mr. Wright. Um, like right Okay, guys, so just getting back to it. Um, here's the deal. The sun doesn't emit only light. It also emits particles. Okay. Now, some of these particles are traveling at extremely high velocities, and some of them carry charge. Okay. So we call this the solar wind. And particles can move 800 kilometers, not per hour, 
per second. Like that's incredibly fast, uh, but it can get even faster than that. Okay, like 1.6 million kilometers per second. So that's extremely fast. When that happens, that's when there's like a solar storm, that kind of thing. And here's the deal. This radiation would be toxic to us, but Earth is protected because we have a very strong magnetic field that protects our planet. Okay. And so, as you know, a compass needle will point north. So we have two magnetic poles. That is, a, you know, the north pole down there and that is a south pole down there. And uh, yeah, inside Earth is something like inside our, our molten core is something that creates a very strong magnetic field. And it's a good thing it's there because it protects us. It protects us from what the sun is throwing at us. Now, it doesn't block light, obviously, because we need the light. So it doesn't do that, but it does block these streams of particles. But some particles can enter through the polar cusp. Okay, so some of the wind comes in like this. And when they enter the atmosphere, these particles will excite the atoms in the atmosphere, and those atoms will then glow. So the atmosphere will start glowing. We call this phenomenon the northern lights, or if you're in the south, southern hemisphere of like Australia, the southern lights. The technical name for the northern lights is aurora, like aurora borealis. Okay, boreal means of the north, and then in Australia they call them aurora australis. Austra australis means of the south. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> the magnetic shield protects us, but it also Okay, directs some of the solar wind into our polar regions. And here we have this beautiful aurora. So here you can see this sort of green, well, maybe highlighted here, this sort of green band of color. And you can see the reflection of it in the water underneath. Those are aurora, guys. And uh, they're really quite beautiful. <clears throat> we don't often see them in Ottawa. Okay, in fact, you'd have to have pretty strong solar activity for to see it this far south. I, I do want to tell you this, though that in 1859, there was a coronal mass ejection. So that means that the sun released uh, mass from its surface, this huge amount of mass. It hit the earth, okay? Uh, didn't kill anyone, no, that's not what it does. But like, you could see the northern lights across the entire planet, even as far south as the Caribbean. So basically they saw aurora everywhere. It's this massive thing and we, the, there was somebody with a telescope who had a solar telescope that you could look at the sun with it. He actually saw the solar flare about 24 hours before the aurora started. Okay, so there's this coronal mass ejection. He saw this big, big eruption on the sun, and then it took about 24 hours for it to reach Earth. And then we have this spectacular aurora display. People who were around at the time, they wrote that uh, they thought it was daytime. Okay, in the middle of the night when this aurora were, that was so bright. Okay, and like I said, you could see it all over the world. Now, there's a reason why we would find this scary today. I'll explain that later. Not because it's gonna hurt us personally, it's because of what it might do to our technology. Anyway, here's a picture of Aurora Australis down there. Uh, if you wanna see what Aurora Borealis actually looks like, I'll just play this video. Um, there's a little bit of music that goes with it. Okay, I'll, I'll just let it play for a moment. going to mute it so I can talk. So it's a bit of time-lapse photography, not much. You can see cars driving by there, okay? So the time-lapse is not very significant, but you can see the movement of the aurora. So that is, and there's a reddish color there. So those bands of color, if you've ever seen aurora, you'll, you'll know it because there's really nothing like it, okay? Um, yeah, and uh, we can see it. This is probably in the north somewhere. You can see, as I think this is northern Scotland, I think that's what they said. So anyway, you can see aurora if the sun, as far south as Ottawa, if the sun's solar activity, like the storms that sort of occur on the sun's surface, if they're intense. And actually, they become intense once every 11 years. The sun has an 11-year storm cycle, okay, where no one's really sure why it's 11 years. Nobody really knows why it's like that at all. Okay, there's a lot we don't know about the sun, but we do know, because we can keep track of it, that uh, solar activity increases on an 11-year cycle, 
and the magnetic poles of the sun will flip every 11 years. Okay, and that's something that can happen. And during these times, you can sometimes see the aurora further south. And uh, if you really get a big coronal mass ejection during this time, um, yeah, you might see even see them like down in Florida. Okay, and uh, in fact, that happened um, uh, in the one in 1989, actually. Okay, in, and when the sun went into its uh, you know, 11-year cycle. It got to the, uh, the period of time where it has very intense solar activity, and you could see the northern lights in Florida. Okay, but something bad happened too. Uh, it knocked out the electricity grid in Quebec. Okay, so it didn't hurt any person, but uh, we rely a lot on technology, and that's why these things are now considered kind of a scary event. Um, what would happen if we got a really, really big one of these things, and it knocked out all of our power grids and our technology okay all right so what I said here was that the Sun's activity peaks every 11 years so that's important to remember uh, solar flares and coronal mass ejections okay you can get like uh, plumes of plasma get ejected from the Sun's corona and travel extremely high speeds into the solar system like around a million miles per hour or 1.6 million kilometers per hour now the Carrington event this was what I mentioned in 1859 Okay, there's an astronomer named Richard Carrington detected a massive coronal mass ejection with his telescope. Okay, and about 24 hours later, there was a spectacular display viewed basically completely around the world. Okay, um, and that was a spectacular display of aurora. They were so bright that miners in the Rocky Mountains thought the sun was rising. They actually got out of bed and said, all right, guys, time to get up. And then they just found that it wasn't the sun at all. It was just these aurora borealis. Okay, um, Okay. now this was in 1859. The only kind of technology that was around in 1859 was a telegraph machine. Now a telegraph machine is like a Morse code thing, but you don't send it over radio waves. Radios haven't been invented yet. You send them by wire. So let's say somebody in San Francisco wants to talk to somebody in Washington, D.C. Well, you have to run a wire all the way across the entire country, right? And then you tap on your thing, dee, 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 and you send them a little signal. Okay, so they're powered by electricity. So this was like uh, electricity had been invented by this time. And, uh, you know, you, I have my little generator and my telegraph transmitter, say here. I run a wire to your house and I send you a signal. Hey, you're late for school. Dee, 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 you know, Morse code. You have your receiver on your end. It's powered by electricity also. So in 1859, when these, uh, when this massive coronal mass ejection hit the earth, uh, those machines went haywire, those telegraph machines. Some of them turned on when they were unplugged. In other words, they're being powered by the magnetic electromagnetic induction that was happening as a result of the fluctuating magnetic fields in this coronal mass ejection. Now that wouldn't hurt you or I, but it will damage electronics 100%. Okay. It's like an electromagnetic pulse, okay, which is sometimes used as a weapon okay, to disable someone's electronics. Um, yeah, that's like one that's a global scale, hitting all the electronics all over the world. Now, back then, with only telegraph machines, it's no big deal. But one telegraph station caught fire and burned down. Uh, some of the operators got shocked while they were touching the equipment. And like I said, some of them were able to uh, send and receive signals with their power sources unplugged because they're actually being powered by the uh, coronal mass ejection, okay, right? It's fluctuating magnetic field was strong enough to power their devices even when they're unplugged. It's almost like a, a ghost in the machine, right? Anyway, I think it's not hard to imagine how terrible that would be if that happened today. Let's say it's in the middle of winter, okay, January. We get this coronal mass ejection and it knocks out all the power in North America all at once. Okay, now we have electricity that's used for so much. It's not just used as a telegraph. It's used to power and heat our homes. It's used to power our electronics. We're all carrying electronics in our pockets, right? Imagine if I set off something that, you know, disabled everyone's cell phone all simultaneously. Not just disabled it, wrecked it. Okay, you can see this is kind of a scary scenario today. 
uh, now we live in a very technologically advanced society with lots of technology all around us and we kind of have grown dependent on it. I have an electric car that could be fried by this. Okay. Now, when do we do for the next uh, intense period of solar activity? The answer to that question is 2023. And that'll last for a couple of years, probably 2023 to 2025. We'll get more northern lights. We'll get more coronal mass ejections. Uh, would one hit the Earth? Well, could. One as big as the Carrington event. The scientist who saw it was named uh, Richard Carrington. Um, yeah, well, maybe, right? It's possible. We think one hits of that magnitude every couple of hundred years. But today is the only time, be the next one that happens will be the first one that happens with a technologically advanced society, okay? Uh, whereas if you live back in the Middle Ages and one of these things hit, you get this beautiful Aurora display, that's it, <laughs> right? So it doesn't affect your machines that you're using. Okay, Quebec, March 1989, knocked out all the power for 24 hours. And that was a small one, okay? Or not 20, I think it's about 10 hours, actually. I said nine when I researched it online, nine hours. Um, yeah, it uh, was strong enough not to burn anything or to catch fire in anything or anything like that, but what it did was it tripped the surge protectors and they had to reset them, but it took a long time because it was a massive power failure, okay, in the whole system, okay? Now, uh, July 23rd, 2012, we had one the size of the Carrington event, so a huge, huge coronal mass ejection that just missed, like it just missed. Okay, and that we definitely had cell phones and technology and electricity with 2012. It's only, I mean, that's within your lifetime, right? Uh, yeah, I wanna show you this video. And this is a great one to watch the whole thing. 2.50 Universal Time on July 23rd, 2012. The sun oh, unleashed an incredibly powerful coronal mass ejection or CME. A CME is a huge cloud of plasma that bursts out of the sun's atmosphere and is held together with magnetic fields. An average CME travels at about 1 million miles per hour and weighs around 2 trillion tons. On this particular Monday, however, the sun unleashed a perfect storm of plasma. Thanks to NASA's far-ranging heliophysics fleet, we have an excellent picture of the event. The incredibly high-resolution view of the Sun provided by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, or SDO, revealed the beginning of the eruption in several different wavelengths of ultraviolet light. NASA's twin stereo spacecraft orbiting the Sun ahead and behind Earth gave a similar view from alternate perspectives. The stereo satellites also carry coronagraphs, which block the bright solar disk to make the fainter extended solar atmosphere, or corona, visible. As a result, they were able to image the actual CME as it left the Sun. The CME headed in the direction of the Stereo A spacecraft at an astonishing 6.7 million miles an hour. As the CME arrived at Stereo A, the coronagraph and stereo's wider field heliospheric images were pummeled by high energy particles which appear like snow in the imagery. The joint ESA and NASA Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, or SOHO, that has been observing the sun since 1995, captured footage of the CME in both of its coronagraphs which overlap their fields of view. All of these data allow computer models to reconstruct the full shape and expansion of the CM. Kind of pause it there for a second. Okay, so if you see this display here, okay, what happens is the sun releases this massive burst. That one hit the earth. That's not the one they're talking about. That's actually a smaller one, okay? Uh, the sun's going to give a few burps first. It's going to go like pit, pit, pit. And so here you might get a nice little light show of northern lights, but that's not the big one, okay? The big one's coming. So just keep watching and just watch carefully here. There's a massive one that almost fills like a whole quadrant of the solar system. So Me. The main event is preceded by a few smaller scenes, one, one. one of which was Earth-directed. 
next one. It is immediately clear how much right larger there. and faster the July... Okay, so that one there, it missed the Earth. It's like it's traveling the opposite side, but it, if you, it almost covered half of Earth's orbit on the opposite side of where we were, but it missed us, okay? Had it hit us, it probably would have caused like absolutely widespread um, technology failure, okay? Cell phone networks, our internet would go down, our power grids would go down, okay? And this would not be a simple or a quick thing to repair, okay? It's not like a few uh, surge protectors being tripped at Quebec Hydro, okay? That just need to be reset, take a few hours. Uh, you know, transformers can be set on fire, okay? And transformers, not the robots in disguise. I'm talking about transformers like, for example, uh, the ones that are attached to your house that convert the electricity from a high voltage down to a low voltage so it's safe in your house. It's attached to everyone's house. There's a transformer. Every house, every building, okay? Those, imagine those all at once catching on fire, okay? That's a massive failure of our infrastructure, and it could be quite devastating when you think about it. And so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, that never would have been a problem in a pre-technological society, but now we're worried about what might happen if one of these things, it's not going to destroy the earth, it's not going to make you sick or anything like that, but it's an effect of the technology that we become reliant upon, okay? So to send us back into a pre-technological world until we can fix it, okay? All right, so anyway, you, we have, you now know what aurora are. You know what a coronal mass ejection is. You know why we're worried about it now. Okay, so this is all information that for a test that we'll have sometime next week that you might want to, you know, remember. I'll give you a review before we have a test. But yeah, that's it. Now, I, I'm, I told the students this in class, we're going to skip lesson six entirely, okay? So when you look in the course outline, I'll go there now. When you look in the course outline, and where it says lesson six, what we're gonna do is we already talked about astrology and all that. So we are going to cancel out that homework. You're gonna skip it. I am giving you permission to skip that homework assignment. Okay? Uh, yeah, we did all this. Stars, constellations, navigation, your horoscope. We talked about that. That's ancient history. Let's let's uh, stick with the modern science, okay? So I'm gonna skip right now. So today we're doing lesson five and lesson seven. This one we're not doing, okay? So it's two lessons a day. So let's go ahead, the rest of this is quite short. So it won't take me long to talk about satellites. Okay, so let's get to it. This is now, uh, I wanted to mention this to you. Um, how does gravity explain satellites? Now a satellite is anything that orbits something else. So the moon is Earth's natural satellite. Does that make sense? Um, Jupiter has like 70 satellites, okay? Big, small, four really big ones, and then the rest of them are quite small. Uh, Saturn has many satellites too. Um, not as many as Jupiter, but getting up there, I don't know, 30 or something or, or so. I don't remember the number offhand. Um, yeah, Uranus has moons. Neptune has moons. Even Pluto has a moon, okay? Mercury and Venus have no moons, but Mars... Basically, everything else has moons, okay? Either one moon or many, okay? So uh, those are called natural satellites. Now, they orbit because of gravity, just like the sun. We are, Earth is a satellite of the sun, right? Because it orbits the sun. Now, Earth orbits the sun because of gravitation, but how did Newton get his head around that, okay? Like, how do you explain why a moon, which is just a big rock, how come it stays in orbit around the Earth? Well, here's how you think of it, okay? Let's say you have, here's how Newton thought of it. Let's say you had this massive launcher. Now, in, in this case, going back to Newton's time, cannonballs, okay? Um, you know, if you throw a ball, here, I'll start with a, a black ball. You throw a ball from this thing, and here they sew it landing like that. If you don't throw it hard enough, it just comes back. It follows a curved path. Just picture yourself throwing a football. Think of the path a football will follow, or a golf ball, anything like that. It follows this parabolic arc, okay? Now, what if, since the Earth is a sphere, apologies to the flat earthers, but it's just a fact, since the Earth is a sphere, um, if you launch a cannonball with enough velocity, 
Okay, like here, that wasn't hard enough. This one as well, not quite hard enough. It went really far, but it still landed somewhere on the Earth. But what if you gave it enough velocity so that the curve, it's gravity that pulls the object back down. But what if you gave it enough speed so that the curve of its path, because of gravity, the Earth is trying to pull it back down, but it's moving so fast sideways that it never gets any lower. Okay, so it just goes like that. That is an orbit, okay? Now, as you can imagine, you probably have to throw it pretty hard, right? So the actual number is somewhere around 30, 40, you know, times the speed of sound. So we're talking about, you know, thousands of kilometers per hour, okay? Now, can we do it? Of course we can. We've done it. Have we launched satellites into space? Absolutely we have. We don't use cannonball launchers. We use rockets to do it, but we can do it. Now, the trick is you got to get it out of the atmosphere because at speeds we're talking about here, the atmosphere would cause them to burn up like a meteor. And we don't want to launch our satellite and then it's instantly destroyed by friction. So what we do okay, is we first get it up out of the atmosphere, then it speeds up to the orbital velocity that's necessary at a given height. Okay, so what's happening is these... Just like when you throw a ball in the air, it's in free fall. But what you need to understand about free fall is you don't have to fall down to be in free fall. Okay, you're kind of falling sideways here, following a curved path. Like when you throw a football in the air, as soon as it leaves your hand, it's in free fall. It goes up and then back down, but it's in free fall the whole time. Okay? All right. So now, you can think of it this way. Here's a more modern version, but it's still a cannonball launcher, okay? So let's say we're launching somewhere near the equator. So here's the North Pole up here. Here's the equator down here somewhere. So it's a top-down view, almost looks like a flat Earth, okay? But anyway, here, depending on how hard you throw it, okay, you can get different orbital altitudes, okay? So if you throw it with just barely enough speed, you might get this path here. I'll use a different color. You might get this path here. Okay, but if you throw a little faster, you get this one here. So that is a higher elliptical path, right? So if I want it to orbit a little bit farther from the Earth, I might give it a little more speed. Okay, we have satellites at many different altitudes, so that's what you would do. If you throw it too hard, you're in trouble. It'll escape. There's a number called the escape velocity. If you give an object escape velocity, it'll actually won't orbit too much speed it'll escape and never come back. So it'll escape Earth's gravity altogether. It might curve a little as gravity's trying to pull it back, but it's not coming back. It's gonna escape and it won't orbit the planet. It'll just move off into space. And when we're going to Mars, do you wanna launch something to another planet? It's gotta escape Earth's gravity, right? So this one's too fast, fast for orbit. This one is way too fast actually, but these ones are are good enough to get you in orbit. By the way, in grade 12 physics, just to spoil the surprise for you, we actually work out the specific number. You can, it's really, you know, we can't, I can't do it in grade nine because you don't know the math yet, but when, you'll get there when you get to grade 12 in a few years. Okay, um, we actually do the calculation. Say, okay, let's say you're on the moon. What do you need to escape the moon's gravity? Well, there's a number you can calculate. You know, scientists that are building spacecraft would know that, know how to do that calculation. It's actually pretty straightforward, okay? Uh, Earth, no problem, we can calculate the value, okay? That's called escape velocity. All right, actually interesting fact, on escape velocity of a black hole, I'll explain what that is next week, a black hole has an escape velocity of the speed of light, okay? Or higher, and basically nothing can go that fast, so nothing can escape, not even light. Okay, so look, I wanted to mention this. The moon's orbit is tilted. So well, since we're talking about orbits, the moon's orbit is tilted five degrees, which is, by the way, why we don't often have solar eclipses. So if the sun is over here, that's the sun, um, you're not going to get a solar eclipse. The sun's rays will hit the Earth like that. That's a new moon, right? And same thing over here. If the moon is down here in this spot, you're going to get a full moon and you're not going to get a lunar eclipse. And the reason why is because the sunlight can just hit it 
okay? Now, it depends on where the sun is, too, but, like, uh, remember, the sun is a bigger than this. So maybe I should erase that ray. I'll draw another ray like this. So it just, whoops, going right through the earth. That's a mistake. It just hits the sun, and then this would be a new moon, right? This would be a full moon, okay? So anyway, there you go. That's why, like, because of that tilt, we don't often get eclipses solar or lunar. Uh, but every once in a while we do, and that is when the moon is here or on the other side, and the sun is either like, I can't really draw it, but the sun, like depending on where the earth is in, in the, you know, in the uh, orbit around the sun, but like the sun could either be way over sort of behind the earth, like over here, I can't really draw it, but over here somewhere, that's the sun. So here's the sun over here, not to be confused with the Earth or Moon. Or if the sun is sort of on our side, okay, so it depends on where we are in orbit. If the, if the Moon passes exactly between the sun and the Earth, that's when you get an eclipse, right? Or if the Earth passes in between. So it, it just depends on where the Earth is, or the Moon is on its orbit. But the tilt means that very often we get new and full moons, okay, because the, sun, the, the Moon is off axis. Okay, kind of. And the sunlight can get to it. All right, so anyway, this is a picture of a GPS satellite. I don't know why I included it exactly. I just thought I'd show you. Typical satellite has solar panels because there's lots of solar power when you're in orbit in space. Okay, and there's no shade or clouds or anything. Okay, so yeah, there you go. That's a GPS satellite. There's lots of those out there. Uh, in fact, Earth has pretty much got a saturation point. There's so many satellites out there right now that uh, it's almost a form of pollution at this point uh, still odds of collisions are rare um, but if you go out in the country you'll see little dots sort of holding their course as they move across the star chart they're not planets they have a very high uh, or a very fast orbital speed and so they move very quickly across the chart those are satellites you can see the space station that way too Okay, so it's kind of cool. So there you go. Oh, one more thing I wanted to mention that I didn't mention here. It's in your textbook questions. Geostationary orbits. Okay. So geo means Earth. Stationary means, well, stationary. Okay. So Earth is a ball. And let's say this is the North Pole up here and a little dot. Okay, that's the North Pole. So you're looking down on top of it, okay? Now Earth spins like this on its axis. So a geostationary satellite, <clears throat> I'll color it red. So here's a geostationary satellite. It orbits the Earth <clears throat> with a period of 24 hours. So it hovers over the same spot all the time. Now it's not really hovering, it's orbiting, like it's moving. But it's matching Earth and Earth's rate of rotation. Okay, so here, the satellite orbit, orbital period, I should say, is 24 hours, which equals Earth's rotation period. Right, day and night. And therefore, the satellite hovers over the same spot. Okay? So it hovers. It's not really hovering like a helicopter, although it might appear that way. It's actually orbiting. Okay? And it's just going once around every 24 hours. Okay, and there's a certain orbital altitude necessary for that, which you don't need to know. And that's why you can point your satellite dish, like tell, like your, say, Bell Express View or something, tell satellite dish. You just point it at one spot in the sky, because that's a geostationary satellite. TV satellites always are. Okay, so you can just point your dish at it and leave the dish alone after that. It doesn't have to track the satellite. Anyway, so that's it, geostationary. 
Okay, so let me just review the homework. <clears throat> so for today, you're going to do um, lesson five. Okay, so this homework here, you're going to do that. Page 312, number one to nine. Uh, you're also going to label the, or do the matching on the handout I put in your homework folder, which only take a few minutes on the sun structure. And then you're going to do lesson seven. So that's that one right there. And basically that takes us to the end of the first chapter on space. There's one more chapter after this. So we're due for a test, but we'll do some review first. So we'll talk about that. Okay. Shortly. All right. So guys, uh, I'm sorry this took so long to post today, but, uh, listen, I hope you have a good afternoon and I will see you tomorrow morning. Okay. Bye-bye.